Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. Hey, Paul. You know, due to the fires in Irvine, our studio is shut down, so we are once again doing the show remotely. I, I, I think the fires, however, are much more under control than they were a couple of days ago. But, geez, more than 100,000 people have been evacuated from their homes. Paul, today on our show, we have Lindsay Davis, a, a just a super special guest. And I'll, although Lindsay and I only recently met, we hit it off like a couple of deeply kindred spirits. And I think our listeners are in for a real treat today. To, today, Lindsay and I will take a deep dive into what I'm calling flirting on the edge of the unknown. In our chat, we will discuss how venturing into the unknown can result in the discovery of our truer, most inner selves in spite of our deep fears of facing the unknown. And we seem to have such, such a fear of the unknown. You know, in fact, I have found in life an unfortunate truism that's far too common. And, and, and that truism is a bad known is preferable to any unknown. Now, Lindsay Davis is a most sought after professional coach, educator, and class classical concert musician. She is a veteran of living on the edge of unknown. As a as a converted converted perfectionist, Lindsay discovered and actually nurtures a new, fresh, and innovative approach to life. Her journey and her deliciously unknown destination will be the heart of our discussion today. With that, I can't wait to bring Lindsay Davis onto the show. Lindsay, welcome to the next chapter. Thanks so much for having me, Charlie. I'm so excited for this conversation and just ready to dive into this topic. As am I. You know, we, as I said in the intro that, you know, we haven't known each other that long, but our conversations are just so rich. I, I think we, we talked about them being rich and refreshing. Two people who think weird, I think. I think so, too. Think weird. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in our handful of discussions, we are both devotees of flirting or hanging out on the edge of the unknown. Tell me, in your opinion, why is messing around in the unknown even remotely valuable? Great question. And actually, I'd love to hear your answer, too. I find we each have a unique lens on this. For me, hanging out on the edge of the unknown is really where we find more made of. And when we're playing our edge and we're against what we're not sure what we're, how we're going to react or how we're going to handle, that's where we not only get to see who we are, but we really get to see who we can become in it. And I think the value of that, man, I think it makes all the difference between going through the motions in our life and, and just the same old, same old, what we think the us of yesterday would it be able to do. And instead, we play towards and lean into what's uncomfortable and we become and reinvent someone completely new and a stronger, more agile version of ourselves. And and who doesn't want that? Yeah, I like that. I like that that sort of discovering or sort of be, the be, the becoming idea is that you know I, I'm really into sort of evolvement or evolution and that we're always in process of becoming we are never static and that even when we're even when we're static we're we're still in a process of becoming more static but I, I i love the becoming whatever whatever got you to thinking about the idea of becoming it's it's it, it seems to be a, a key word for you it is it's no pun intended become everything essential. Um, and I think it really came from, well, let me back up. There's, there's a thing, we know this as children, that who we are is fluid and adaptable to what we want to do and um, how we want to show up that day. And, and 
children know this. And then somewhere along the line, we grow these very rigid boundaries of who, what we think our personality is and what kind of person we are. And um, we start to define ourselves with these labels. And then we become ever more resistant to change or anything that threatens that version of ourselves. And what I found in my own journey early on was that this sort of putting myself in a box and having these definitions of who I had to show up as and who I was and who I wasn't really created me to be um, the opposite of what I really wanted. And I became very rigid and really as life changes because change is the only constant, 2020 has showed us that, that really I had become very brittle to change in life and very easily shattered. And I have found that that resistance to change shows up for people either in that brittleness um, or if they hunker down and hope it passes over, uh, if they go harder in the way that they've been doing it, or if they take a look and really become agile and and really drop that resistance to change, um, that becoming makes all the difference in their their possibilities for themselves and, and opportunity. You know that, that that's so that's so true, and it has so much to do with the way with the environment that we're raised in and, 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 the, and the culture that we come, are we, are we raised in a, very few of us are raised in a creative, adaptable culture. We are, we are raised, our, our parents have their ideal for who we should be, what the right child, the perfect child would look like. And they create a set of rules. And at first we live by our own rules and then we begin to, model ourselves after these rules until we become those rules. And then we hit adolescence and become something else. Now, now with you, structure and standards have been a really important part of, of your, even all the way through your college as a child and through college years, were they not? Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's, it's consistent to even a lot of the population I work with, if they're, disciplined musicians, if they're disciplined athletes, if they grew up in a disciplined home environment, um, many times they're actually used to a certain type of standard and a very high level of control of their environment. And they can get really thrown for a loop when um, that illusion of control melts away and they realize that what they thought that they can control and of this arbitrary, if I do all of the right things in all of the right way, then the result they're hoping for will happen. And I've really found out over and over again, that's not true. I'm sure we all have encountered that's not true. That's a complete illusion of control. And, and so it, it kind of begs us to change and adapt our relationship with what we can control and what we can't. You know, there really is that illusion of control and there are, there are certain times, even things we control, you know, I live a very free, but points of my day are very ritualistic. There are things that I do regularly and Jocko Willink, who is a, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jocko, but he's a, uh, a Navy SEAL and a very, very highly decorated Navy SEAL. And he writes that uh, discipline is freedom. That if you have disciplined times in your life, then you have time to be free. But if you're undisciplined, then you're always threatened by the tyranny of the urgent. But there can be a discipline that takes over that doesn't allow for freedom. And I think that's what you're talking about in control, is it not? I think so, too. And, you know, I, I have read Jocko Willick, and I love actually listening to him. Um, extreme ownership and discipline equals freedom are really great mindset frameworks. And, and I, I think it is one side of the coin and it's a big one. And then I think the other side of the coin is to surrender um, to that unknown, surrender to what we can't fully control. 
And there's one thing I like to teach with, with my clients are these two circles of a small circle, which is circle of control. And then we have a larger circle that encompasses that, which is the circle of concern. And we can be concerned about a lot of things in life, but we can only control four things. Um, we can really only control how we handle our thoughts, how we handle our emotions, how we handle our actions and our efforts. And that's really all. Everything else goes in the circle of concern or really surrender. And we sort of have to let it flow the way it wants to and then adapt those four things within our control to the environment and a little bit of how things show up and what wants to happen. So what we think, what we, how we feel, is that right? Yes. What were the four things again? I love those. Yeah. It's how we handle thoughts. Um, we can't always control the thoughts that come in, but right. we can control which ones we dwell on and where we focus. We can, you know, how we feel, how we handle emotion. And it, again, it's not repression or denying that we're feeling in this bypass, but it's how we handle the feelings and how we move through that and aren't controlled by it. And then we have our actions, what we choose to do with our time here and how we engage with our goals and our day and the people around us. And then the effort, like that extra something, the energy that we bring to something and the engagement with which we play. That's, that's, that's really good. You know who you sound a lot like right there? No, tell me. You sound a lot like Victor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning, you know, his, his mm. conclusions out of the concentration camp. Yeah, great those work. Are, those are very Victor Frankl ideas that that even in the midst of the boundaries of a concentration camp, he found the freedom that he had the freedom to manage his own thoughts and manage his own feelings and and manage his own expectations. It was uh, it's it's a, it's a brilliant work and and that reminds me a lot of that. So so. I'm curious, you, you live on what I would call a journey of curiosity right now. Now, now you came from a, a journey of perfectionism and perfectionism and curiosity, you know, probably at their core could be, could be opposites. What led you from perfectionism to curiosity? Was it an event? Was it a, a breakthrough? What, what was that? Yeah, I think the word would be breakdown. <laughs> no, but uh, <laughs> breakthrough uh, is great. Well, Maybe yeah, but breakdown is break. probably more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It was the basically the systemic failure of my perfectionism. And there got to be a certain point of life where Everything that worked to a certain degree up into that point, everything that got me to where I was, the lifestyle I was in, the career path I was in, the relationship I was in, even you know the, the spiritual or financial well-being I was in at the time, that was a certain type of engagement with executing the rules and what I thought was expected by the book. And then it just systematically stopped working and life fell apart. And it really was a series over time. And it wasn't fun at the time. It doesn't have to be that dramatic for us, uh, but I resisted it a lot. I really wanted to go back to this illusion of control. And so it took me a little bit of time to get it. And What's I find a little bit of time, Lindsay, is that? Three years. Three years, okay. Yeah, three years, four years, something like that. And I just got to the end of my rope and it really was this emotional. I remember having a panic attack, my first one ever. Um, I had no idea what was I was going to do with my life, where I was going to end up. I just knew that I couldn't keep functioning the way that I had been, which my go-to pattern, which I see very frequently um, in the high achievers that come to me um, is to push harder or work harder or go at it again. And there's, it's this 
grit and almost a misunderstanding of grit that I just kept running against the brick wall until it broke me. And I was really just brought to my knees. And I remember um, just not, I, I just remember this time of, of just feeling shattered. And I go, I, I don't, I don't know. I got nothing left. And I don't even know who I was talking to at that time. And I was like, you, you got to show me what to do next. And it was in that moment of clarity that I realized that who I had been up until that point wasn't going to be the person that was going to be able to move forward. I was going to have to choose who I wanted to be next, who I wanted to reinvent myself next, how I wanted to engage with life differently. And it became this discovery of curiosity where I was willing to sit with this question of, I don't know. And I remember people asking me, what do you, why are you doing, you know, why are you going to, you know, yoga teacher training? I don't know. It's the thing I got to do next. How are you going to use that in your career? I don't know. It's just the thing I have to do next. Because it um, didn't fit. It didn't fit in the culture that you were in. It really not only, didn't. Yeah. Not, not only was it unusual, it was probably, probably looked against. It was probably like, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're messing with our core beliefs here. You can't be doing that. And so the level of the depth of emotional distraught had to be just tremendous for you. It, it was. And I think that's what took, you know, I say it doesn't have to be dramatic for everybody. It really doesn't. And I, and I think the universe knew that that's what it took for me at that time to wake up and really stay awake so that I could get on the path that I believe the higher self in me, my soul actually craved, which was a, a path of freedom and empowerment and confidence and agility and curiosity and discovery. That's really the me that I had wanted to be all along. That's amazing. That is, that is absolutely amazing. You know, one of the things, one of the words that, that you've, you've brought up in our discussions and, and you've mentioned today, and that is what you choose to be. And, and you, you wrote something that, that was really sort of, sort of bewildering to me. I've never thought of it. And you talked a lot about the, the tragic human tendency to choose to live in a relationship with fear. Now, fear is really an obstacle to living in the unknown or experiencing the unknown or flirting with the unknown. But you say, you suggest that we choose to live in a relationship with fear. Lindsay, that's really, that's thought provoking. And I have no idea what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> well, maybe, I don't know, is the great answer there too. I don't know, but I want to find out. Um, but I... Fear is an interesting thing because it, it really is the catalyst to our transformation, our deepest transformation, or the thing that keeps us stuck in a pattern of complacency, um, really that comfort zone. It can be the fear of you know failure, the fear of getting hurt, um, the fear of what people will think of us. But if we look at it, many times it's it's... It's the fear of what we can't fully control. What if we show up and we do all the things and it still doesn't work? And it really reminds me of this quote by Rumi. I completely love and it totally unsettles me anytime I'm still resisting fear. <laughs> and it's run from what's comfortable. Forget safety. Live where you fear to live. And I, I love that quote. I couldn't love it more um, because it's really this whole essence of being willing to feel the sensations of discomfort, feel it in the body, realize that we're not necessarily scared of the actual situation, but we're scared of feeling the emotions that maybe we have devastated us in the past. And to really be able to hold that discomfort without repressing it or denying it or avoiding it or trying to numb. 
and really still find that center of safety and groundedness and wisdom within us. There was this instance I just had to, and and I think your listeners will appreciate this. I was just in the mountains uh, camping. We were sitting up on this ridge and um, my husband was kind of scoping with his uh, spotting scope and, and binoculars and looking around and he wanted to see how the elk were moving and the deer were moving. And I was sitting up on this ridge and I had to be still pretty much for three, four hours. And it was cold, like really cold and windy. And normally I would, my body, my mind would be resisting those things. Very similar to fear. Armor up. I'd want to complain, kind of get out of it. When are we going to be done? I hope this is done soon. And I just had this insight. This is, this is practicing my relationship with discomfort. And so I parked on a rock, very cold. And I just felt what cold felt like in my body with awareness. And I just felt what the wind felt like. And and the most beautiful thing happened. I actually also felt this clarity of appreciation for the sun and the sunset and how beautiful it was. And it really shows me that when we change our relationship with fear or discomfort, or unease, we also are able to access gratitude and curiosity and elevated emotions at the same time. They don't negate each other. It's fascinating. I, you know, and I, and I, oddly enough, I really do get that. I, you know, it, it works for me. Is it, do you think it's similar if, you know, changing our relationship with fear is related somehow to changing our perspective? It's just the way we the way we look at things, the window through which we're seeing our circumstances, it, it does, do those come into play? I think so. I think that's a piece of the formula. Um, the way we choose to see, the way our, our lens and perspective, I think that's a huge piece. And I also think there's this open willingness to experience the, the sensations, to fully experience the moment like we can really talk ourselves into or out of fear, but just to notice how how we're experiencing it, how are we reacting within it? Um, can we shift our perspective and also be honest with how we're feeling about it? And are we still willing? to be curious? Are we still willing to lean in? Are we still willing to step forward and engage with those, that mindset, emotion set, actions and effort? You know, I have a question that has to do with fear and with control and with anger. And I want to come back to that right after we take a quick break. Okay. Sounds good. You're listening to the next chapter with Charlie, and I have my very special guest today, Lindsay Davis, who is a professional coach, um, as well as educator and 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 classical musician, and and we will have Lindsay's uh, contact information. And if you're interested in a professional coach, I I can't recommend anybody better than Lindsay. And and we're talking about about delving into the unknown. We're calling it flirting on the edge of the unknown and how critical the unknown is and our fear of the unknown. And Lindsay, as we were talking about our fear for the unknown, you talked about control and and it made me think of the relationship between control, anger, and fear. And uh, I would be a sponsor to Alcoholics and AA uh, there would be several people that were dealing with the issue of anger, and it never, never failed that anger, the source of anger is fear. That is what anger is out of control. I'm no longer in control. I, I, and I fear not being in control, and I fear the unknown. Therefore, my go to is fear. Have you, have you dealt with angry people in that way? Is that, is that something that, that you've worked with in the past? 
I have. Yeah. And I, I think you're spot on with your experience. It has been my experience as well. It's a cap. The, it's like the emotion over fear um, and all of the subsets of anger, you know, it's like not always just explosive anger. Sometimes it's an implosion, like self-punishing, um, very harsh self-criticism and shame. There's also frustration, um, mild frustration, deep frustration, um, and, and all those kind of subsets of anger. And when you go a little deeper and somebody feels safe enough to share the truth, that's where they're able to start being honest and say, I'm actually afraid, um, or I'm actually really worried, or I don't know what's going to happen. And I really think that the gateway towards progress, and you've probably seen this with Alcoholics Anonymous, is finally that willing honesty. You can build from there. You can build from there. Well, sobriety is all about is about is about ruthless honesty. And until we get to the point of being ruthlessly honest, we are going to continue to wrestle with our addiction. You know, it is one of the one of the big one of the big issues. And what I found from that experience, as well as my experience in life, I think so many times it's not we'd be happy to be honest if we only knew what to be honest about. We're, we're not honest about when we're angry, we're not realizing even that it is fear that is making us angry. That's where coaching, you know, and a, and a, and a sponsor or a mentor or somebody else, a, another human being that you really trust that, that has some sort of life maturity that can help you see that really what you're dealing with, buddy, is fear. You're not, you're not dealing because you're a bad person. You're, there's something wrong with you. You are, you're you're evil or you're self-condemning or you're shameful. It's it's that you are fear of not meeting up to standards and and not being accepted. And and in my language and in the tradition of contemplative prayer and mysticism that I live in, it's about it's about fear of not being loved. You know, and that was it's what happened to me as as a child, as being an abandoned child. And those are so deep core issues, Lindsay, that, you know, we're, we're talking about the very basis of who we are, aren't we? Oh, absolutely. And the ramifications of, of what happens when we believe, and I've been there too, that we're never good enough, that we're not only not loved, but maybe even deeper under not worthy of love, not deserving of happiness that that has a huge ripple effect on the person that we think that we are then the choices available to that version of ourselves and i i found more resistance there when when somebody believes that they're not good enough or they're not worthy um or or whatever the flavor of of those messages are it actually feels inauthentic to become a different person. Yeah. That's boy, you, 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 you said a mouthful there. I've got, I've got like 12 questions, which I have to limit to one. And that is I have elected to make a distinction between worthy and deserving is we live in a culture in our, in something I, I, I so value in our, our meritocracy but we live in a culture where we deserve what we get. We, you know, we earn what we get, but we also have that negative connotation that we deserve what we get because we have done bad things. So we deserve it. And I, I detest the idea of deserve. It has nothing to do with deserve. And, and then when it comes to worthiness in, in my, in my religious philosophy, we as created in the image of God, we are indeed inherently worthy. There, you know, we, 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 you, worth is not something you can inherit or is not some, something you can earn. I mean, we inherit it. It is not something you can earn. Our worth is not something we, you can earn. It is something you are, you are born with. Do you, do you agree with that? Oh, yes, absolutely. That's and, great. You well, know, go ahead. When you're talking about worth and deserving, those are sometimes 
I've seen those and maybe you've seen it too, as sometimes the driver or the, um, the, the push behind the desire to grow and even like the self growth movement and personal mastery or professional success that can be one of the drivers. And it's almost like uh, being driven because deep within there's a sense of deficiency or not deserving. And so I've seen that. I've also seen that it doesn't have to be that. And it's really easy then to judge driven people uh, or ambitious people as driven on that hamster wheel of never enough. Um, but I've actually seen the other side, and especially in high achievers or, or performance level, you know, musicians, athletes, what have you, there is a drive to grow because it brings joy to grow. They're totally great with who they are and their own soul level worth. And that's never a question to them. But you'll ask them, you know, are you good where you are? Uh, there's always a next level. There's always a next level or um, a next chapter or a next possibility or an innovative edge. And um, I found that that can come from a source of so much joy um, and curiosity of like, I wonder how far I can take this thing. Um, that is just a delight. And it's it's such a gift to be able to help somebody shift from drive from deficiency to drive for the sheer joy, no matter what you get out of it, it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, I knew we were going to come to this quote. I was just listening to Tim Ferriss podcast and he had Seth Godin on. And for those of you who don't know Seth Godin, all I can say is you didn't, you need to know who Seth Godin is. Seth Godin is probably not, not only the guru of marketing, but he may be the guru of life. He may be the, maybe the smartest, the wisest man I've ever listened to on, on radio and they were talking about they were talking about what do you do in life you know what kinds of decisions do you make and Seth is all about about success and and doing things he's a marketing guy so he's he's talking about how to be successful but he asks this question he says the ultimate question in his life in life is what would you do with your life if you were guaranteed to fail not to succeed if you were guaranteed to fail Yet you love doing it so much, you had to do that. What would you choose? And, you know, Lindsay, I just love that quote. If there was no way I was going to be successful, but it absolutely gave me ultimate fulfilling, like my painting. My, you know, my painting, you know, nobody bought my paintings, but I loved painting. It was just, I loved doing it because I loved doing it. And it, it had nothing to do with success in the eyes of someone else's. It was like me looking at it and going, hmm, I like that. I, uh, I'm so glad you brought up that quote, too. And I wholeheartedly also advocate people check out Seth Godin, such a thought leader. But it, and I'm so glad this came up, too, because it goes into the like the real the opportunity to redefine success on your terms. And the the definition that I've been playing with for some time and and what I encourage my, my, my people to consider is what if success just means the cr creative expression, like the thing that is within you that wants expressed next, that just like Seth was saying, it, it really doesn't matter what other people think about it or how successful it is in extraneous terms, but that it, it was the thing that wanted created through you in the world at this time. And I think that that just changes. It puts, it kind of turns the whole game on its head. It's like the question that can change everything. And, and then it really is the unknown. Cause it's like, I don't care how long it will take. I don't care how hard it might be. Uh, I don't care what the response of the public will be but it's worth doing anyways. You know, I so concur. I love it. I, I, I feel, I feel supported in doing that because I, 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 I live in that almost un-American, almost un-American thought pattern because, you know, we are the land of success, are we not? And, and, and nothing, and there's nothing wrong with success. I mean, I, 
highly value success. And, you know, and, and we've both, both experienced our share of it, but that is not the driver. Tim and Seth were talking about that we're all in the game. Admit it or not, we're not, we're all in the game. We need to define the rules to our own game. What are the barriers of boundaries, not the rules so much, but what are the barriers and boundaries of the game of life that we choose to play? And, and that is what you seem to be going to in your idea of, um, of, oh my goodness, of, of what you, you talk about, you talk about going into the unknown and the idea of becoming, and you also talk about the unbound self. I was really, I really resonated with that concept, the unbound self. Can you, can you describe that for me? Yeah, I love this. And, you know, to touch back and double, double click under, you know, Seth Godin and Tim Ferriss's conversation, which I, I, I still have to listen to, by the way. Um, but just this idea of defining the rules of the game for yourself and the bounds, I feel like that's what we're talking about when we're talking about living in integrity and being aligned to um, the values and the principles and and the priorities that, that we're choosing on purpose and who we choose to be in this life. And, and then to play the game from that, that point of view. And that's really the first step I think in a lot of times is like, who, who are you? What are you about? What's important to you? What do you want to do in life? And I think that those are big questions for somebody to start with. Big, um, big, you know, so, so big that I, I want to interrupt and I want you to mm-hmm. give me clues, Lindsay, how, how do you discover that? I know you and I are assessment addicts, you know, so we, you know, self-assessment addicts and, and our friend Kameen has given us both a, a character assessment tool that was really helpful. It was very positive in saying, you know, what, what are the positive characteristics that drive you? And, and you know, it was translated into your virtues. Um, I, I think that was really helpful. With assessments being one option, what are the options to, do people have to discover who I am when I've been aligned for so long with the false self that has been determined by my by my lineage, by my upbringing, by my society. Yeah, I love it. And I think the first place that I like to begin is by actually clarifying, who do you think you are? Who have you been told to be? And one of my rules of thumb is never believe an identity or a story about yourself that isn't empowering or doesn't set you free. And I and I think that's inspired by um, the late Sean Stevenson. And Wait, would you repeat that? That is so powerful. Yes. Yeah. Never believe a, a story about yourself or an identity about yourself that isn't empowering or doesn't set you free. And so, even when it comes to assessments, um, if if part of that you don't resonate with and you don't want it a part of your story, you are free to develop differently. And I think that's important for people. And one of the pieces where you can start to discover, and this really is a discovery process and it's really fun to do with um, a coach or a mentor or a trusted person uh, because they can see your blind spots. You know, we think we're being a a certain way, but maybe we're kind of not, but it's really fun to start to look at, well, who do, who do you fundamentally not want to be in your life? Great question. Great like, question. Like, let's get that on the table. What are the rules you don't want to play by? Great. Now, what is really important to you? And I think one of the places that's fun to start, and not like we want to emulate people forever, but we can really be informed and inspired by the people and the giants all around us, historically, um, currently fictional, uh, but have these inspirational archetypes that reveal like, hey, you know, I really admire, um, let's say, uh, I really admire Seth Godin, original thinker. I'd like to really foster and nourish that trait a little more in my life. Or I really admire, you know, so-and-so for their honesty. I want to foster and develop that when we start to look at the fact that we get to choose values and identities and then develop that more intentionally and really cultivate those character traits in us, 
I think that's where um, life becomes a lot more fun. I, I, I love that. You know, you know what you're sounding like? You sounded like you read my blog last week uh, because that was exactly what my blog was about, was um, uh, born to imitate mm. and that we are imitators. And I, I, I suggest an exercise of which you imitate someone you respect. And, and, and I'll say this as briefly as possible, but it's a really helpful exercise. Identify wow. somebody you really respect, admire, appreciate. Write five to six sentences on why you respect, admire, and appreciate that person. Then go back and circle those particular characteristics that are most important to you. That just, you know, there's some that are, you know, that you'll write about that are important, but some really, really strike home. And they said, you've just taken the first step in identifying your values. Mm-hmm. When when you take a look at somebody you admire and say, I want to imitate that, then that, that's what I put it in, imitate the best in others so others can imitate the best in you. Yeah, great exercise. Uh, great, great exercise. And that is, you know, sometimes adults resist that because they think that that imitation means that they're being fake. And I think that's really what I'm speaking to a little bit when I talk about the unbound self. Um, it's the self that you are cultivating and imitating and becoming before it's so practiced that it's now in your bones and embodied. There's this middle stage and I'm kind of a nerd about nature shows. And this is sort of coming from hermit crab migration. They line up these shells in the wild and um, they move shells. So they kind of move as a community, like smallest to largest, and they all move shells. Well, when they're moving shells, there's that vulnerable stage where they're a hermit crab without a shell and predators and, and all sorts of things can get them. And they feel really scared at that point, you know, the consciousness of hermit crabs. <laughs> and, but I found that actually this really illustrated this unbound self because we have a practice self, like, who we think we have to be and who we've shown up to up until this point. And then the game moves or the game that that person has to play, which sometimes really just doesn't light us up anymore. It's very limiting. Then we start to cultivate, like you said, uncover the values and the people we admire and we start to imitate them, but it's, it's still hard. We're still imitating. We have to think about it consciously. Practice is a little bit more laborious. It's just not automatic yet. And there, that's a vulnerable stage because somebody will say, well, I don't feel authentic. Well, authentic to whom? You're authentic to your practiced self. So if you keep practicing and really cultivating those values, you fundamentally become a different person. And pretty soon it's in your bones. And then you bring your own style and expression to it. And it unfolds as, as the you that you wanted to become. I, I love that. And I, you know, I, I, I have this, you know, I, I think I'm coming to admit this aversion to authenticity because anytime something becomes a 25 cent word that's used by everybody, then you know, that word no longer has any meaning, has any authentic meaning. <laughs> and, and you use the combination of radical integrity and alignment. And, and I like that as integrity it's true to myself and, and, and it's a little different than authentic. It's, I, you know, taking, making the effort, to identify my core self to, and then have the integ- integrity to, to radically align myself with those values that are me. And when I do that, I am, I risk popularity. I risk, y- y- you know, admiration, but I am, I am contented because I am myself. Yeah. I gain you gain yourself back. <laughs> yeah, you know, as, as we've, you know, we, we, we've talked all around the unknown and in and in and out of the unknown, but the unknown is such a beautiful place because it is such an open place for discovery and for expression. And if it were not for the unknown, 
we would live in the predictable, would live in the, you know, I'm reminded of you as a musician. And and I'm going to simplify it, so please forgive me because I'm not a musician, but you practice the scales all up and down, so not so you can be a great scale producer, but so you can be a great musician. So there are certain certain things that you have to practice, that you have to own in order that you can be an expressionist and move from beyond that. Is that is that not true with the musician? Yeah. And any musician listening, uh, amateur professional understands that it's this like devoted, deliberate commitment to practice. And the practice isn't always the fun part. I mean, I think you can develop a sense of fun and curiosity within it, but there is, you've, you've got to run the scales. You've got to learn the bones. You've got to learn the basics and notes. You can't really improv and express beyond your current level of skill. So then whenever you're put in a performance situation, musician or life or business, you're going to fall back on your current practice level of skill. And and so it becomes a really inspiring process to practice leveling up your skill set so that when it's time to perform, you've got kind of more, more sounds to play with, more textures, more varieties, more options for yourself. And, and I think that becomes um, more enjoyable for both the player and the audience. Oh, I, I love it. You know, it reminds me of, of a concept I'd like to close with. And, and it's a concept that a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to producer Paul about, and, and I call it jazz, that, that life is jazz. And, and the metaphor comes from Miles Davis, you know, the arguably, well, certainly the most well-known jazz trumpet player ever lived and, you know, could be the best that's ever lived. And, and in 1959, he produced a most creative and unusual album called, called Kind of Blue. And what Miles did was he created chord progression and melody. And then he had the fabulous musicians of um, John Coltrane on sax, Cannonball Adderley on sax, and Bill Evans on piano. You know, the finest musicians of the times. Believe me, these guys had run the scales a few times. But what they did is that they, when they did their solos, it was in harmony well, not not exactly musically, but in life harmony. It was in harmony with the melody, but they were all improvisions, improvisations. They were all riffs that were done just, they completely let their soul play. And no one had ever done that in jazz. It, you know, the, the notes had always been written. And Miles Davis created jazz as we know it today. And I, I think that's a metaphor for life, is that, there's a chord progression we follow and there's, there's kind of, we each have our melody, but there are points of which we are doing improvisations. We are doing riffs that are just going off into the realm of the unknown and the, the realm of the beautiful. I mean, how does, does that resonate with the musician or is it just weird me? Oh no, it's you, you've shared this metaphor with me and it has, it has just reverberated. I mean, it, it's so beautiful because I, I found it so true as well that there are certain chord progressions and they don't have to be externally given to us. They might be. There's principles we can play with. Um, there's ways of, of growing a business or there's ways of discovering ourselves or engaging with our life. There's sort of like the chord progressions or the notes or um, the harmonic movements or um, the rhythms. Um, and, but you know, what's fun is you get to be as rigid as you want to be when you're in your practice studio, right. Or you're rehearsing, but like when you step out on the stage and especially an improv performance, I just gave a couple, um, outdoor concerts. I won't put them in the same category as, uh, Johnny Coltrane or, uh, Miles Davis, of course, but, um, I just had, all we had in front of us was the chord progressions. 
And as classical, wait, wait a minute, as classical musicians, you were asked to imp- improvise? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that you talk about playing the edge of fear. Initially, <laughs> this when I first started doing that, you just never know what's going to happen. And there is a piece of you that goes, where are the notes? Tell me how to play. What's the style? And they just go, hey, you know what? Let's just let's just play and see what happens. And it's like a whole other thing to practice and then step out onto a stage with an audience. Um, and you've never played this song the exact way twice. And, and you kind of just look at each other and you're like, we kind of know the chords. We know how it, it fits together. I wonder how it's going to turn out. Oh and my. it's this beautiful opening to maybe something greater than the very rigid structured self could have expressed or created. It's like something more beautiful, more profound is able to, um, is able to be expressed. I'm, 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 I'm not a musician and I'm, and I so want to be in another life. You know, if there's reincarnated lives, one is going to come back as, as, as a musician and to be able to, I, I just can't imagine, well, I can imagine, but I can't get there. Imagine the feeling of what it's like to just let the soul go. The soul is just in your instrument. The soul is just free and, and doing whatever. There is a voice coming, a muse. There's a voice coming from somewhere that's leading, leading you off into this wonderful place. Oh, Lindsay, I'm, I'm jealous. Well, that can be your next chapter, Charlie, becoming a musician. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, in wrapping up, that is for our listeners. Life is jazz. And and it is it is about knowing the chord progressions, knowing the melody, but it is those times of improvisations when we are free to express Express our unique giftedness, our unique talents, our unique place in this planet. It's just, it it is, you you know, you talked about beauty and joy, and that that really is the greatest joy, don't you think? I, I so do. There's nothing more to devoting your effort and your action, your emotions, everything you bring to the practice. And then to just let go and trust the expression that wants to come through. And it reminds me of the quote as we wrap um, from the Bhagavad Gita. I know we've talked about that before, but um, you're entitled to your labor, not the fruits of your labor. If that doesn't say practice hard and show up and let go and surrender to the beauty of what wants to unfold, I don't know what does. I love that quote that you're entitled to your labor, not the fruit of your labor. You are not entitled to the fruit of your labor, but wonderful labor will have fruit. Mm-hmm. Know that it it will come, entitled or not. Um, Lindsay Davis, um, you are awesome. I, I I I love chatting with you. I love your insights. Uh, I am so glad we were introduced. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with me today. Oh my goodness. This was amazing for me. Such a gift and treat to be here. Um, Thank you for the invitation. Um, This was a highlight for me. Thank you. And, and our listeners, you're at Lindsay Davis, you're at Lindsay at lindsaydaviscoaching.com. I will put that in the show notes. Anybody that wants to get a hold of you and uh, you know, not even to hire you just to get a hold of you with a question. You're really open to all of that, right? Right. If they have any questions that came up today, um, I love hearing from people. Um, Also, if they want to reach out and be on the short list uh, to be notified, I have a journal coming out within the next couple months that's called The Path to Possibility. And it really is this invitation for somebody to step in to this unknown and to open up to the greater potential and opportunities in front of them. And it's, it's a very open, um, spiritual, but not religious practice. A um, lot of fun. So if they want to be on the short list when that comes out, also um, send me an email. And that's great, too. Do you have a link to it or is it just an email to it? 
Just send me the email so I know okay. to let you know. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Please do that. I know I'm going to put my name on the short list. Awesome. Um, I'll make sure. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, Thanks again, Lindsay. I, I also want to thank all our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie. And uh, please be sure to check us out on our website. Tell your friends about us. Uh, and you can check us out at thenextchapter.life, L-I-F-E. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.